It has removed everything but a slight tremor. I write normally now. I play the piano normally. I've got no rigidity in my fingers. The fatigue I had suffered for 10 years with was actually disappearing. Dr. Costantini himself treated 2,500 people successfully. And when people come back to me and they say, it's worked, you know, I've got all my energy back and I can now get out of a chair and I've thrown away my walking stick. I mean, it's just absolutely great. And they are just so pleased. If this was a drug, it would be headline news. Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition. And in today's video, I'm joined by a very special guest named Daphne Bryant. Daphne was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease more than 12 years ago. For those who don't know, Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative condition of the central nervous system, which is classed as progressive, meaning that there's no cure and there's generally no way to reverse the changes. You can only slow down the progression using pharmaceutical medications. The initial symptoms generally start with the tremor, slowed movement, rigid muscles, and impaired posture and balance. Later on, there's problems with the autonomic nervous system. Someone can lose the ability to speak, to move their arms and legs, and they can become wheelchair bound. Several years after being diagnosed, Daphne was introduced to the work of an Italian neurologist named Antonio Costantini. Costantini is well known for his pioneering work using thiamine or vitamin B1 in very high doses for patients with Parkinson's disease and has published several different reports. After attempting this therapy and seeing massive improvements in her symptoms, she began networking with others with this condition also. It was at this point that Daphne decided to write the book, Parkinson's and the B1 Therapy. This book is designed to be a practical guide on how to begin the therapy, what to take, how much to take, and the potential pitfalls that might come along as a result. This was ultimately inspired by the work of Costantini, who in the latter stages of his career used thiamine to treat over 2,500 patients with Parkinson's disease. Although not a cure, he found it could lead to rapid improvement and reversal of some symptoms and effectively halted the progression of this condition in many people. Aside from publishing his case reports, he also published video evidence of the improvements online. And as you can see, these changes are quite astonishing, especially for a condition which there's supposedly no cure. In fact, there are many thousands of people across the world who've been implementing this therapy based on these reports. The results for some of these people have been nothing short of miraculous. Like Daphne, many others have been able to regain their life, despite being told that they would only go downhill from then on. In today's show, I am very pleased to welcome with me, I have a very special guest. Her name is Daphne Bryan. Thank you for coming on, Daphne. It's a pleasure. Okay, so Daphne Bryan was, um, she is an author of a very recently published book and it's titled Parkinson's and the B1 Therapy. I had the pleasure of reading this book last week. I think it's an excellent overview of a very under acknowledged topic. Now, Daphne was um, originally diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2010. She then found the work of an Italian neurologist called Ant uh, Antonio Costantini. If you followed my other videos, then you might be familiar with his work. Essentially, he was finding uh, that people using very high doses of vitamin B1 could see tremendous improvement in some of their symptoms and help to manage their condition in those who had Parkinson's disease. And so uh, Daphne eventually started this therapy and she witnessed uh, benefits from that and uh, and has been doing it ever since. And this is one of the things that inspired her to write this book. And uh, and really it's an it's an excellent um it's an excellent overview of the entire topic. So thanks for coming on. Uh first of all, Daphne, would you be able to just uh share with some of the listeners, uh tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Um and how did you come across uh high doses of thiamine for Parkinson's? I have been a teacher all my life and a pianist, so a music teacher. And I was diagnosed in 2010 when I first found that I was having problems playing the piano. 
my right hand wouldn't move as fast as my left. And after a year of various tests, I had the shock of learning that I had Parkinson's. Um, the first year after diagnosis, I really became very depressed and concerned. And then after that, I started looking for ways in which I could help myself. And it was seven years into Parkinson's before I heard of Dr. Costantini, a friend of mine who also had Parkinson's and was a retired doctor, sent me a link to an article about him. And we decided between us that we would both give it a go. But to tell you the truth, it all sounded rather too good to be true. Um, this Italian neurologist had found that his patients were improving up to 70%, which is huge. Just so the listeners know, the original case reports were published under the title of High Dose Thiamine as Initial Treatment for Parkinson's Disease. This was a case study of three patients, and they found between 31.3 and 77.3 improvement in uh, one of the ways of measuring motor function. However, a later study, much wider study, was published, uh, and this was two years later, and this was looking at 50 patients with Parkinson's disease. This one was titled Long-Term Treatment with High-Dose Thiamine in Parkinson's Disease, an Open-Label Pilot Study. They also found significant improvement in many of the symptoms. They were amazing. Um, the uh, intramuscular injections seem to have a very quick effect on symptoms. So there was a marked improvement for over a couple of weeks in people's walking and movements and their ability to write and their talking. Okay, and this is in, in Parkinson's being a, a, a degenerative condition, right? It, it's it's considered that you, you only go one way, right? And what I mean by that is generally, you know, people diagnosed with Parkinson's, they're told that it's going to progressively get worse and worse. And there's not much aside from traditional medications that you can take to slow down the progress. Um, and traditional medications do not slow down the progress. So it turns out there's a wide body of scientific literature looking at the connection between thiamine and Parkinson's disease, it, there seems to be a lot of evidence which would suggest that thiamine-dependent processes in the human body, particularly the brain, may become abnormal, may become defective in Parkinson's disease, and this may be one of the driving factors behind the condition. Now, this is not to say that Parkinson's is uh, caused by a thiamine deficiency, but rather there are abnormalities in the processing or the way that the body handles this nutrient. To quote Constantini in one of his most recent papers on Parkinson's, from our clinical evidence, we hypothesize that a dysfunction of thiamine dependent metabolic processes could cause selective neural damage in the centers typically affected by this disease and might be a fundamental molecular event provoking neurodegeneration. Thymine could have both restorative and neuroprotective action in Parkinson's disease. So let's pass that out. What does that actually mean? Well, it's talking about thiamine dependent processes. So the processes inside cells which require thiamine, which need it, those can become downregulated. Those can become impaired, broken, dysfunctional for whatever reason and that by supplementing or consuming high amounts of thiamine by carrying high amounts of thiamine into the cells it can overcome this problem it can counteract it or bypass this blockade and therefore restoring energy metabolism restoring cell function another one of the potential theories was that Perhaps some people have problems with absorbing thiamine. Perhaps they have issues with intracellular transport. By taking very high doses, what that can do is saturate the cells, provide such a high concentration in the blood that it causes massive amounts to enter into the cell so that it can start to be used as it ordinarily should do. And also, they stop deteriorating. 
and stop needing increases in medication. So it all sounded rather wonderful. But I bought the B1, and the next time I saw my doctor, I said to her that I was thinking of taking it and told her a little bit about the therapy. Her attitude was, well, I haven't heard of it, but I know we use high doses of B1 for people recovering from alcoholism. So I know it's safe. So if you want to give it a whirl, give it a whirl. Um, so shortly after that, I started taking it, and it was a sublingual tablet that we had, my friend and I had decided to buy because reading the article about Dr. Costantini, he used injections, and it wasn't going to be possible for me to have injections on the national health. Um, so we thought that the sublingual tablet was the nearest to an injection rather than an oral tablet. So I started taking them and kind of forgot all about it, really, just carried on with my life. Um, I wasn't expecting much from it, so wasn't monitoring it very closely. Um, life got busy. I joined um, an art class and I took up Italian lessons and I started training a choir and one thing and another. And then somebody said to me, you're doing an awful lot. And I thought, well, that's funny. I am, aren't I? But I was so busy doing it that I hadn't really thought that the fatigue I had suffered for 10 years with was actually disappearing. And then a friend said to me, you're looking better. And I wasn't quite sure what better meant. And I said, well, I've changed my makeup <laughs> because I kind of didn't connect it with the Parkinson's. And somebody else said to me that when I smiled, my face was smiling up to my eye, eyes, she, she put it, whereas I had had a ma mask expression before. I still didn't think a lot about it. And a therapist I saw who did um, Bowen treatment on me, which works on the soft tissue, he said to me that my muscles were more relaxed. So I thought, oh, perhaps I'm getting better. But I still didn't really connect it with the B1. That penny was a, a long time in dropping. Prior to taking B1, what what kind of symptoms would you say that you were experiencing on a daily basis? I had a tremor. I had bradykinesia, slowness of movement. I had um, rigidity, which affected mask-like face. It affected my ability to play the piano. It affected my walking. I walked very stiffly. Handwriting was very difficult. It wasn't that it was difficult to read it. It was just very slow doing it. Um, I suffered from anxiety and depression. Um, my sense of smell had gone. So a lot of things. I mean, the rigidity was so bad that on one occasion, um, the rigidity was all around my shoulders and my neck. And on one occasion, I slipped a little with my foot and moved awkwardly and snapped the humerus bone at the top. I didn't even fall on it, but I just wow. moved awkwardly and I heard it go. Okay, so so you you tried to take you took some B1 and you said that you originally didn't notice that much difference, but other people started noticing things, right? Yeah. I, I think the thing is when you find it difficult to do something, you concentrate on the movement. You know, I, I'm turning things in a frying pan and I had to really concentrate how to turn it. And that was my whole focus. When it became easier, I'd be turning the things in the frying pan thinking, oh, I have, have I put the meat in or whatever. You don't say, oh, that was easy. The mind just goes on to the next 
um, action that you're going to have to do. So you tend not to notice when things get easier. You always know when they get worse. But you probably had a headache and then suddenly said, that's funny, my headache's gone. But you don't notice at what point during the day it went. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I think I think you're right. So, so that's very interesting. And so other people were noticing things, changes in in how how you were completing certain tasks or like how you looked or how you uh, came across. Like when did when did the penny drop for you that actually it was likely because of the thiamine that you'd been taking? Well, probably about six months because I'm pretty slow. <laughs> Admittedly, um, it was probably two or three months before people started um, noticing and remarking to me that I was moving easier. So it it didn't happen as quickly as the injection injections do. In the next part of the interview, Daphne tells us exactly how Thiamin helped her. It has removed everything but a slight tremor. So... I write normally now. I play the piano normally. I've got no rigidity in my fingers. I had a neurologist appointment last month, and they do this where you've got to tap your fingers. But she said that I was doing it quicker than she could. So she wrote on the form, no bradykinasia. The original type of thiamine that you tried, that was a sublingual form, right? And what was the dose of that? That can't have been too high, no? I just took one tablet a day, and that was 100 milligrams. Okay. But because you're not losing it through the gastrointestinal system and the acid of the stomach and the liver filtration, um, most of the sublingual tablet passes through the membrane under the tongue and goes straight into the bloodstream. So mm-hmm. you don't need so much. Six months or so later, I found that I was feeling rather hyper. And I thought, I wonder if I'm on too high a dose. So I gradually st- started to reduce it. And now I take three tablets a week. There are um, many other people who just use ordinary thiamine hydrochloride. However, the the most important thing to understand here is that the dose that they require is going to be much higher. So the therapeutic dose for Parkinson's, from what I understand, is usually sitting around 1,500 milligrams to up to 4,000 milligrams per day. That's grams. Um, Other people like to use a mixture of different forms. They'll go with the more bioavailable derivatives like TTFD, like benfotiamine, or like sorbutiamine. Now, usually um, the dose required for these forms is going to be lower, primarily because you get more that's absorbed and it has a higher affinity for the brain. So a dose of TTFD or benfotiamine may be 600 to 1000 milligrams, whereas the dose for thiamine hydrochloride could potentially be a lot higher than that. I still take some Parkinson medication but I'm not yet taking a starter dose, which is reckoned as sort of 300 milligrams a day. I take 200 milligrams, which for 12 years of having Parkinson is pretty amazing. Indeed, it is. And it's not just you who has experienced these these kinds of benefits, right? Uh, You're part of a a much wider community of people. I mean, would you mind telling telling us something about that? Dr. Costantini himself treated 2,500 people successfully. So you've got that bank of people. Um, I belong to a Parkinson forum called Health Unlocked Cure Parkinson's. And I don't know the exact number, but there are a lot of people on there who successfully use B1. And now we've got the Facebook group, Parkinson Thiamin HCM, um, with 6,000 members, many of which are using B1. But out of the 6 million Parkinson sufferers worldwide, 
was still a small amount. One reason I wrote the book was to spread the word. You, like many other people, like many of Costantini's patients, like many other people on the online forums, have some pretty remarkable testimonials, right? Something so simple as a vitamin, you know, can halt the progression or can drastically improve many of the symptoms of a condition which is considered that there's no treatment for right that's that's a that's a fairly amazing opportunity for people with parkinson's but how does your neurologist react to that you know have you what what do they say when you when they see that you know they do these tests on you and they say that there's like a uh, uh, you know, you're functioning well for someone who's had this condition for 12 years. It would be really nice if they said, this is amazing. Tell me what you do. I will do it with all my patients. But they, they sort of say, what do you credit the cause of this improvement in your situation? Um, and I say B1 and they say, yeah, but everybody's different they say um perhaps you're just one of the lucky ones it's really disappointing that they're not more excited i mean if this was a drug it would be headline news and to think it's been around for 10 years it's very unfortunate right and it seems that i it's not just i i mean costantini himself as you write in the book uh, he he tried to get funding for much larger studies, right? And they did complete, they completed another study with how many they people? Had another study for 50 people, yes. And that also showed remarkable benefits, right? O over a longer period, yes. Yeah. So just for reference, here is the study. It's titled an open, open label pilot study with high dose thiamine for Parkinson's disease. It was done on 50 patients, and to quote the authors, they say, in conclusion, we found that the long-term treatment with the, with the intramuscular administration of thiamine has led to a significant improvement in motor and non-motor symptoms of the patients with Parkinson's disease. This improvement was stable during time and without side effects. I don't, I don't know if you know, but what was, what was the stumbling block in getting more funding? I think they've, they've approached charities that like the michael j fox um and i think various others and prepared they prepared the research the colleagues of dr costantini um but they can't get funding i think one issue that they are putting as their reason for not supporting the research is that not the same dose is the right dose for everybody. So it's not a one size fits all dosage, but then that applies to other drugs as well. That's an important point you, you mentioned there about dosage. And that's something which I think it would be interesting to, to discuss now, actually, because you yourself know that the dose that worked for you might not necessarily work for other people. And that tends to be the case in uh, a lot of the research that Costantini published, and this is not only just Parkinson's, right? He found similar with fibromyalgia as well. There seems to be somewhat of like a threshold dose, right? Could you tell us some more about that? Like why, what kind of doses, do, if someone has Parkinson's, you know, what kind of doses might they need to see, to start seeing the benefits in their motor function? If you're taking injections, which a few people do, then you're probably going to take um, two injections a week of 100 milligram. Um, or if that is too high, and I can talk in a minute about how you know it's too high, um, some people are on two 50 milligram doses per week. But when Dr. Costantini was helping people over the email, um, not face to face, and they weren't able to get injections. He suggested they used um, a, an oral dose, um, thiamine HCl, hydrochloride. Um, 
that has a lot more problems when it comes to dosage. It seems to depend on many factors. One is the extent of the uh, symptoms and how long people have had the disease. Um, it also seems to be affected by the weight of the person, how much they need. But I believe it has an awful lot to also depends on the efficiency of the gastrointestinal system. People with Parkinson's are not renowned for having a good gastrointestinal system. And I think this makes a lot of difference. So whereas one person with the oral dosage might find it satisfactory to take one or 200 milligrams, another person might need 4,000 milligrams. So there's a huge spread in an oral, oral dosage. I haven't come across such a, an extreme um, in the sublingual. If someone's taking sublingual, then it's more consistent the dose that they might need, like 100 milligrams once yeah. a day or something like that, whereas... Yeah, with sublingual, I found that people start on 100 a day and then if they're happy on that and don't come across any worsening symptoms, then they stay on that dose. A few people after a month will find that their symptoms start to get worse again, which is a sign that the dose is too high. And then what I suggest to them is that they leave out a day or two days, or even three days. So they're taking the tablet some days and not others. Okay, okay. And so the the Costantini himself, he he didn't actually know why why some people would need such high doses, right? He had some theories, and there's other researchers who also have their theories. What he saw and what was documented in the evidence in numerous conditions was that using probably pharmacological super physiologic doses. And just to give people some context, the dietary requirement for vitamin B1 is 1.5, 1 to 1.5 milligram per day. So even taking a sublingual 100 milligrams, still, you know, almost 100 times what you would ordinarily get from food. But when you've got some people who need to take up to four grams, that's 4,000 times the amount that you would ever find in the diet. So 4,000 times. And it's only when they reach that 4,000 times that they start, there seems to be like a threshold, right? It's like, all of a sudden symptoms start to fade away and, and someone notices major improvement. He found something very similar in a condition called fibromyalgia. Uh, in the, the research on fibromyalgia was showing that there were two uh, cases where they would have 1,500 milligrams. They'd see no benefit prior to that dose. And it was only at 1,800 milligrams that there was basically an all or nothing effect. It was like these people's fibromyalgia pain and fatigue like disappeared basically overnight, whereas any, any smaller amount, anything below that dose didn't, it didn't have that effect. So it was very much like a threshold that needs to be met, a certain amount of time it needs to get into the system, maybe to kickstart some processes or something. And, and that's when the, the benefits occur. So, okay, so if someone has has Parkinson's, right, and they might be familiar with Costantini's work or they might just be coming across it now, you've, you've written this book, which is, I, I think, uh, a perfect guide for people to basically know what to do, when to do it, what not to do. Um, what would your advice be for someone who is starting out other than buying the book and, 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 and learning about what's in there? You know, what are the kind of uh, practicalities or practical aspects of taking B1 to try to improve Parkinson's? What, what would you say is important? Well, first of all, a person has to decide what form they want to take the B1. If they're going to be able to have injections, if they're going to take an oral dose, or a sublingual. And there are advantages and disadvantages of each. Swallowing can be a problem in Parkinson's. So because of this, the injection and the sublingual are useful if anybody has swallowing problems. 
because if you take the oral and you need, say, for example, 2,500 milligrams, which is a dose quite a lot of people are on, and you've got 500 milligram capsules, you're going to need five a day. So it's a lot of tablets to take. So you decide what form you're going to take the B1 in. And then you need to start and work out whether you want to start high and come down or start low and work up because you're going to have to hunt for the perfect dose. As you say, it you get no symptom relief until you reach that correct dose for you. Uh, if you go too far above it, then you start to have worsening symptoms. So it's just a narrow band that you've got to find. When Dr. Costantini first advised people, he used to start them high. So he would start them high, they would see some positive results, and then they would get worsening sy symptoms, and then he would bring them down by half. It, they would have a break and then take half the dose and see if they achieve the positive symptoms without the worsening following it. Um, the problem with that is the worsening symptoms are a bit annoying. I mean, they only last a day or so. You, you might find your PD symptoms get worse or you feel jittery or hyper or anxious or your sleep is disturbed. But as soon as you stop the B1, everything goes back to normal. So it's not a, a serious problem. But then you had to take a break before you restarted at another dose. So you were taking, having a break, halving it, taking. But if you started lower down, then you didn't have any of the inconvenience. You started, say, on 500. So latterly, he was recommending people started low. 500. He used to say, have two weeks on 500 if you don't see any benefits take a thousand for two weeks. But in my experience, I have found that it can be sometimes up to six weeks before people notice improvements. That's not to say there aren't improvements at two weeks, but it's the noticing them. So I suggest that people stay a little longer at each level. But on the oral dose, you've got a long way sometimes to go from 500, then 1,000, 1,500, then 2,000, 2,500 before you get there. Right. OK. And, and so if someone decided that they wanted to do this, I mean, it's, it's definitely not a cure, right? It doesn't, it doesn't cure the condition. No, but it stops it. It does stop it getting worse. Right. But you do take it alongside your Parkinson meds. Okay. So that's a, a really key point as well, is it's not a replacement. It is a supportive therapy, which seems to be able to halt the progression or s at least slow it. I mean, are you, do you, in the future, do you see yourself not taking B1? You know, do you think that you'll, you'll stop it or do you plan on continuing it? I plan on continuing B1. I'll probably have to reduce it. I, love, I joke to somebody saying I, I'm reducing it so much that there'll come a time when I just have to hold the towel. <laughs> I intend to stay as well as I am. Right. I, you know, I'm just, I don't worry about it. I just expect to be like this as long as I have B1. Yeah. And that's quite amazing that, you know, a, a vitamin can, can do that. And I think one of the reasons why the conventional medical system, uh, I think sometimes they, they don't believe people, you know, there's, I, I have many clients who have also mm -hmm. kind of, uh, these neurodegenerative conditions that are responsive to, to B1. Unfortunately, people, uh, the, the conventional medical establishment really doesn't know that much about the medical potential medical benefits of using vitamins. And it doesn't necessarily just apply to thiamine. It applies to niacin, vitamin C, you know, vitamin D. Um, 
some of the other B vitamins, they don't know that much about it because their model is based on drugs. And that's just the way it is for better or for worse. Um, so it is, it's very unfortunate that this is not a, a wider, a wider known thing. Um, but so just to clarify something, so you have, you found your sweet spot dose and then you're gradually kind of been reducing it and you're still continuing to reduce it. Because my sweet spot, sweet spot dose has changed. Okay. Now, why that happens, I don't know. But it got to the stage at each level where worsening symptoms started to happen. And eventually, penny dropped and I thought, ah, the B1 is now too high. So I took a break. Uh, for a couple of weeks and then reduced it right okay okay um and and would that be the case for other people have you found other people in in the parkinson's community who do a similar thing they start quite a high dose and then gradually reduce it over time based on the symptoms it has happened to a lot of people okay and the trouble is when it happens and your symptoms worsen it can be very easy to say, ah, oh, this is my Parkinson getting worse, instead of saying, I wonder if it's the B1 is now too much for me. I think that's something that you you go into a lot of depth in your book. Your book is is, is very good. Uh, for my listeners, it's, it's not a, a science book. It's very much a practical, down-to-earth guide on, like I said before, what to do, what not to do. And it's really designed for people who don't necessarily have any science background who were diagnosed with Parkinson's or maybe even a similar condition. We don't know if this also, uh, you know, if this also applies to other neurodegenerative conditions, there was a recently study, recent study published on, on Huntington's disease, which indicated that uh, there may actually be a similar kind of a, a thiamine processing problem in a region of the brain. Uh, which is associated with the condition. And they found that in animal studies, at least giving high high amounts of biotin and thiamine in conjunction could reverse the, the changes. So for the listeners, here is the study that we're talking about. The authors concluded patients and mice with Huntington's disease had decreased striatal thiamine pyrophosphate. That's in an area of the brain. So lower amount of active thiamine in this area of the brain. High dose biotin and thiamine supplementation improve radiological, motor, and neuropathological phenotypes in HD mice, meaning that it improved the symptoms. This suggests that treatment might be useful for patients with Huntington's disease. Now, I'm pretty sure that this research team have gone on to initiate human clinical trials, and I think that they're being conducted as we speak. So it'll be very interesting to see the results and if they are applicable in humans as well. We really don't know how many conditions can actually respond to high doses. Well, Costantini did uh, about eight, eight or nine different health issues he gave high dose thiamine to. Some of the other conditions that Costantini studied We'll have several studies here, one being thiamine and fatigue in inflammatory bowel diseases, high-dose thiamine for fibromyalgia, for Friedrich ataxia, multiple sclerosis, fatigue after stroke, spinocerebellar ataxia type 2, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, myotonic dystrophy, essential tremor, and dystonia. So just to chime in here, I've personally found that there are a bunch of different conditions which respond really well to thiamine. And these are not typically classed as thiamine deficiency kind of conditions. Uh, One thing that you do find is that for many people, there is this threshold or this all or nothing effect, meaning that they can take a certain amount, but below the amount that they need per day, uh, they don't really notice much benefit. It's only when they reach a threshold or a specific dose that they require, uh, all of a sudden they, they notice rapid improvements. We don't exactly know why that is, but it doesn't seem consistent with the concept of addressing a deficiency. Rather, it highlights the concept of maybe a thiamine dependency or something similar to what Costantini originally uh, theorized and something that I've spoken about in the past in my writing and in various videos and things. Uh, This concept of thiamine being used as a tool 
to improve metabolism as a tool to basically overcome metabolic blocks or uh, improve intracellular absorption. And to do that, you need to reach a, a very high amount inside the cell. You need to reach a high amount coming into the body and you do that through megadosing. Below that megadose level, um, the amount that you would get through the diet or through a simple multivitamin is not gonna suffice. And oftentimes it doesn't provide the benefit that people are looking for when they're using um, a, a thiamine protocol. The potential is untapped. And unfortunately, I, th I think the, the current kind of medical model or the research establishment in medicine is difficult to get funding if if there's not potential profit to be made in the therapy. And, and of course, vitamins can't be patented. They can't be sold at exorbitant rates. They're, they're very cheap and down to earth. So it, I think a large part of the, uh, a large a chunk of the information that we have aside from animal studies and mechanistic data mm -hmm. and some of the stuff that Costantini wrote uh, is, is actually the testimonials, right? It's the anecdotes and people will pass that off as, you know, placebo, but ultimately the plural of anecdote, when there's lots of people saying the same thing, it's data. So clearly it works and, and you know, it works. You've shown that it works and you know, many other people, as do I, who it also works for. So it is a really fascinating topic. Um, okay, then. So tell us tell us a little bit more about your book then, um, as in we've gone through what it includes. Uh, the proceeds, where are the proceeds going? So the, the profits that you make on the book, what cause are they going towards? They're going to a GoFundMe page set up by a colleague of Dr. Costantini, to raise money for future research into B1 for Parkinson's. So Dr. Costantini, we, I don't think we've said, died at the beginning of the COVID pandemic in May 2020. But the colleagues he did the other research with, um, they have planned this research project and although they're looking everywhere for funding, they've also set up this GoFundMe page. But I think I'm going to have to sell something like 10 billion copies to raise the royalties enough to pay for the funding. But it's a start. And <laughs> I mean, it's it's the I think it's the thought that counts as well, right? You're putting out a signal to the universe, and and maybe. I, you never know, right? There could be some kind of indirect effect. It could raise awareness and you might have someone who has a bit of money, who has Parkinson's, who sees this and, and says, well, actually, I want to, you know, invest in, in, in this study. We don't know. Anything could happen. Um, but that's, 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 yeah, I think that's a, uh, it's a really interesting topic um, and it doesn't get barely any attention not many people know about it and that's one of the reasons why you wrote this book is because of the lack of people who know about it right yeah I wrote the book initially for people with Parkinson's who on the Facebook page I found I was answering questions every day I was answering people's questions on how much they should take and whether they should take a break and questions like that which suddenly I thought why, instead of these individual answers, don't I just stick it in a book and say, go read the book? But also, I wrote it to provide enough science that they could then show their neurologist or specialist. Yeah. And, and to spread the word. Yeah. And it's well referenced as well, right? Uh, the... The information in there, it's 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 understandable, but it also is a can be a resource for for health practitioners who aren't familiar with this, um, and a patient would be able to direct them towards the scientific literature. So um, I think it could very much come in handy. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who don't know about this. As you said, what is it, six million people diagnosed with Parkinson's? At least. And. Yeah, a fraction of a percentage of that actually knows about this kind of therapy. And when we see the benefits, it seems uh, there's there's really a lot of potential there. Okay, then. So uh, where can people find the book, Daphne? On Amazon, on all worldwide Amazons. 
Okay, excellent. And that's provided both in print and in, on the on the Kindle version. Uh, I can say it's a very easy read. It's very comprehensible, and it's not a long book either. No. Okay. Well, I mean, thanks for thanks for coming on and and having this discussion with me, Daphne. Um, it's it's really been great. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased to hear that you've you've seen a lot of benefits from B1. Um, you know, I get a lot of people get in contact uh, for all kinds of conditions. Uh, it really never fails to amaze me how many people seem to benefit from B1 uh, with conditions that aren't traditionally characterized by B1 deficiency. Is there anything that you would like listeners to know? Where, where can people find you? Um, any any kind of uh, closing thoughts for people with Parkinson's? Is there anything you'd like to like to say before we close up? Well, as far as contacting me is concerned, they could find me through the Facebook group. So for those who would like to find this group, it's titled Parkinson's B1 Therapy. And as far as people with who had a diagnosis of Parkinson's is concerned, my my thoughts will be try B1 therapy. It's not going to happen overnight. They're going to have to be patient and do a trial and error to find the right dose. But it is well worth it when they have found the right dose. And when people come back to me and they say, it's worked, you know, I've got all my energy back and I can now get out of a chair and I've thrown away my walking stick. I mean, it's just absolutely great. And they are just so pleased. And hopefully there's many more who can who who can find this and, and you know, try it and, and hope for the best. Uh, one thing I would add is, is I am going to link to the Facebook group in the in the show notes and in the description i'll link to your book as well so there are communities like this available you're part of them and 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 there's there's many more um and there's there's ones which are specifically about this topic so uh so that i think would be great for people if that's everything then uh then thanks for coming on daphne it was really great speaking with you Thanks for asking me. So guys, thanks for tuning in and listening to Daphne's inspirational story. I hope that you'll go out and you'll buy her book. The proceeds go to a very good cause. Remember, this is going towards new research for Parkinson's disease and thiamine. Uh, Her story was not only inspirational, frankly remarkable. uh, The fact that she managed to regain her function just using a simple B vitamin. Um, she's not alone. There are many thousands who are doing this, but out of the 6 million or so diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, basically no one knows about this. So if you could share it far and wide, if you know anyone with Parkinson's disease, you know, anyone affected by this condition, make sure you send it to them, see what they think, uh, even buy them the book, send them the book and see if they'll read it. I have linked to all of her social media and her book in the show notes below. Uh, So go ahead and grab yourself a copy. In the meantime, thanks for tuning in and see you next time.